by nature, we all are prodigal sons. We are prone to taking a journey to a far country where we seek to do our own thing, even if it means hurting other people around us. The prodigal path was begun by Adam and Eve, and in their fall, wanderlust hit us all. The story of the Bible is how the hound of heaven, to use the metaphor of Francis Thompson, the hound of heaven, Jesus Christ, came into the world to pursue us, to redeem us, to turn our hearts back home with a staggering love that would bring to us God's faithfulness, pardon for us, and peace. It was a stunning love, an exquisite kindness, an infinite passion that Jesus revealed, especially on Good Friday, to turn our hearts home. And that is what repentance really is. It's a coming home. It's a turning our hearts from the kindness of God, with the kindness of God moving us to come to our senses to turn us away from the skewed kind of love that the world offers and proffers to a love that is holistic, that is unconditional, that is extravagant, that is holy. It is something that Luther talked about and said was so important that he made it the first of his 95 Theses when he said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent ye, he meant that the whole life of a Christian, the whole life of a Christian, should be one of repentance, a turning home. Our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 13. And it gets us ready for Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son who journeys away from home, but eventually will come back home. And it also gets us ready for six chapters after that, when Zacchaeus finally realizes the love of God and sees the implications of that is that not only is salvation a free gift, but if he loves God, he will try to stop ripping off his neighbors and stealing from them and taking advantage of them. And so his heart begins to turn back home with great joy. And suddenly he has a heart for poor people and wants to help the down and out. And then in chapter 23, 10 chapters later, we see the heart of a corrupt son of Abraham, a criminal, turning home. As he hears the gift of forgiveness, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that turns his heart toward home, toward the God of all grace, toward repentance. And ultimately, he will hear the words of Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. But more about that later, we come back to our gospel reading for today. Jesus is confronted with an age-old question. The question is simply this. If God is good and gracious and all-powerful, why is there evil in the world? What precipitated that question were two tragedies that had just taken place. Rome, under Pontius Pilate, had just sent a number of soldiers who slaughtered, let the blood out, a bunch of Galileans. And people were wondering, are the Galileans more evil? After all, they're Gentiles, that that happened to them, that that took place. And they were kind of coming up with a simplistic, word righteous answer to that heavy question. And then, about the similar time, there had been a tower at Siloam that fell unexpectedly, crushing and killing 18 people. And so Jesus, recognizing what the people were thinking, Jesus, picking up on body language, uh, recognized these terrible tragedies, and he said to them, do you think these tragedies happened because these people were greater sinners? And Christ surprises them. He says, no, unless you repent, you also likewise will perish. They were not expecting that answer. Jesus knew about both tragedies, and so he uses this as an opportunity to call them 
to repentance, to turn away from their self-righteous kind of thinking, to turn away from kind of a simplistic thinking, and to turn their hearts back home. You know, every week we hear, especially with the access that we have to the media, all kinds of terrible tragedies. We hear so much more terrible tragedy today than I think people did years ago. And in part, that bums us out by the end of the week. How many bad stories, horrible tragedies have we heard? We hear, for example, of a child killed by a drunk driver. We hear of a tornado that takes one house and demolishes it, but the house standing next to it is just fine and handy. We hear of an innocent person murdered by a drive-by gun shooting. And then we hear of terrorists who molest and murder unto death little boys and girls. So we ask the question in our soul, why do these evil, evil things happen? In our text, we are waiting for Jesus to give us the answer. Uh, Job, by the way, confronted God with the same thing because of all the pain and all the suffering that took place in his life. I mentioned to my wife this week, we've had so many people and friends and others that have gone through painful emotional trials, painful physical trials, painful ordeals to the max, I said to Jan, I can't remember ever a week in my life where I've been praying for so many people going through so much deep kind of pain on so many kind of levels. And so we feel a little bit like Job. We want to talk to God and ask Him why He allows these things. And Job confronted God with this question in Job chapter 38. And Job is surprised the answer that he gets. Job asked God, why is he allowing the pain and evil to come into his life? And God turns around and he asks Job, you can count it, he asks Job 77 questions in response. Boom, 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 boom. Job, where were you when I created the universe out of nothing? Uh, Job, can you explain this simple mystery of the universe to me? Job, I'd like you to give an answer to this question. And Job suddenly realizes that he's a little bit out of his league. He gets the point, and the point is this. If we are unable to answer even the simple elementary questions of the origin of the universe and the cosmology of this cosmos, how are we going to be able to answer these deeper questions related to suffering and evil and pain? Jesus jars the audience looking for a simple answer to the question of evil. And the Bible is so good here. The Bible is so careful here. He tells them that unless they repent, confess their sin, they could face something even more catastrophic. What he does is he takes them out of the abstract into the very personal. He calls them to change their way of thinking like the world, always this Pharisaicism, always this self-righteousness, always this selfie, egotistic, narcissistic, manifesto of one kind or another. And he calls them, turn your way back home to God, toward real love. And of course, later on, he's going to amplify this with the story of the prodigal son. You know the story well. The son was hearing the sirens of the world. Come, do your own thing. Come, be the measure of everything. Come and be your own God. And so the young man gets up and he tells his father, I want my inheritance. Drop dead, old man. Give me my money. I want to do my own thing. And so the father, surprisingly, gives the young man his inheritance. And he goes off and he spends it. He wastes it. He doesn't give any thought to planning for the future, no goals, he aims at nothing, and he hits the target, and suddenly he is broke, and he's a Jew, and he's a Jew in a Gentile territory, and he can't get a job anywhere, and the only job he can get is feeding pigs. Now, if you're a Jew and you get that job, that is pretty low. And he longed to have the food that the pigs were eating, that's even lower yet. And all of a sudden, he starts to begin to think a little bit rightly. 
He remembered that his father was kind to him. He remembered that his father was good to him. He remembered that his father provided for him and that his father cared for him. He had something to come back to. And he said, maybe just maybe if I go back home, at least I can work with the higher hands because my father is so much kinder than the treatment I am receiving right here. He had turned his back from a loving father to go the way of the world. And through this experience, he begins to realize by point of comparison, and that's often how we learn, by point of comparison, and he begins to remember the love and kindness that he had left. And he makes a turn. He makes a U-turn. And he's coming back home and he's wondering, if my father follows the religious traditions of the elders of the people, I may be stoned to death. I'm going to be beaten within an inch of my life. It could be very, very bad. But if he is my father and treats me the way he did before, I may have a chance here. At any rate, he had not fully forgotten his father's love. He makes the journey back home. And as he draws near to his father, his father does an extraordinary thing in that culture. He begins running out to his son. He is filled with love. He gives him a new robe, a new sandals, a new status, a new ring. Celebration. His son has come back home. The kindness of the father extravagantly displayed melted the heart of that young man with extravagant love and forgiveness and acceptance. Repentance is coming home to Jesus. And he's waiting with open arms, with arms that were stretched forth on a cross for you and for me. His nail-scarred hands welcome you fully with his love. His open arms have forgiven you and me of all our sin of greed, fear, lust, impatience, and every other everyday sin that gets in the way of our relationship with him. When we come home to Jesus, he gives to us a miracle meal of the Lord's Supper. Provides for us an ongoing washing through the miracle of holy baptism. And increases our love with the details of the story of his love. A love that literally, literally went to hell and back for us on the cross. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is more wonderful than to be welcomed home by Jesus. And every day, the Father welcomes all his children to his family through his Son. Father giving his salvation, life forever, has been won. Bottom line, repentance is coming back home. Through the church, through the bride of Christ, through the cross of Christ, children are beckoned to live a robust life of repentance. We are beckoned to live a robust life of repentance so we can live a robust life of love. That's the connection. Few people really try and get it. Through Jesus, means of grace, Repentance grows strong and the desire to come home more clearly and cleanly and closely increases and love flourishes. How good it is to know on this day that you have come to God's house to come home to hear of his amazing faithfulness and grace. To sing, great is thy faithfulness. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hey, it's good to be back home again. Amen.